dealing with is Nigeria. And if you look at Nigeria, Nigeria, and this is not meant to be derogatory, Nigeria started as a business, not as a country. It was a business owned by a private company, a Royal Niger Company, that learned from their experience in India. So we are coming together today as a continuation of a business set up by Sir Thomas Goldie and his friends. So Nigeria was set up for exploitation and for business. And if you were a foreign merchant, you go to a territory you want to exploit and make money, it's a noble intention for your people. But for the people who are in that territory, they need to know that, okay, this is how the territory got started up. And Nigeria became a British colony also because of business. Because Nigeria was so, it was being run and the company got analysis that, well, it will cost more to run the country and Britain thought, okay, let's buy from you. So Nigeria was born as a business. Even our uh, colonial master who came here, uh, Freddy Lugard, was an employee, not of the British, but the employee of a private company. At the end of the day, Nigeria was sold to Britain for profit. So, but we, who are inside Nigeria, have to know that even the first uh, armed forces we set up with Africa Frontier Force was, they were privateers working for a private company. And uh, you will see that uh, when the Ibadan Army joined uh, the British, Captain Bauer, who was a British man, to go and conquer Ijebu, it was a business expedition because Ijebu were blocking the British from trading. So Ibadan Army was, who had problems with it because they were also trying to sell things. So the seller and the buyer combined together and form an army and destroy the Jabu uh, sovereignty. I bring all of this to, 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 together to let us know that the history, because sometimes you behave in a particular way, your government is structured in a particular way, you are not able to understand why. So there are some behaviors you behave, and if those who are your parents or grandparents, they can see in you the traits of your ancestors. So our ancestors who set up this country, this country, modern country, not the peoples in it themselves, but the structure that we inherited, they set it up for profit and for exploitation. And the lesson we need to learn is to take a, a diversion from that land. Now, Nigeria is a British construct. So, uh, well, I was, so, I was given 25 minutes to talk. I don't know why I'm being harassed now. So I think you know, the structure of what I need to talk about needs to be. Otherwise, people will not understand. Uh, so I will reduce the time from 45 to 30 minutes, but it, uh, it's, it's a very important topic, otherwise we just not get the hang of it. So, so but I, I understand that today is Juma, that we need to go and pray, and uh, we didn't start on time. So I'll summarize it, but I apologize to the audience if the topic is not taken fully uh, as it should. Now, but the question is this. The land remained the land. Whether before the British came, whether uh, when the British came and after now, the land remained the land. And the people remain the people. And there are issues of identity. All these issues of identity, Hausa, Yoruba, Bibio, most of these identities ethnographically are not real. We will address that later. So if you say you are a Hausa man or Yoruba man, if they do your analysis and give you history, as I'm standing here, you are seeing somebody they will call a Yoruba man, but also a Bini man. Also, a new payment. So, and uh, yeah, so what? Yes, yeah, me, because I've done the geography of myself. So, you will see that the best study before you, if it's politically convenient, I can say I'm a Yoruba man, because that's the dominant political narrative. But if you look at the origin, so in this country, beware of anybody who questions the origin of anybody. You should question the allegiance of people in public, not their origin. Because even you are not sure of your own origin, if we do the analysis. <laughs> Therefore, in this country, we belong as the same people. As the authority over the land changes, so does the attitude of the people. So people have become loyal. I will give you a short one. People who served in Oyo for 400 years in the Oyo army, why Oyo had the problems with, within them and the 
a lorry was to come up, they went and served the Fulanis in a lorry with the Yoruba Balogons. The same people also served, or their children served the British to go and sack Shokoto in 1903. So what it shows to you is that the loyalty goes with socioeconomic interest. So and their great grand, their grandchildren now are working for foreign companies to exploit resources in Nigeria. So it is the identity is not the problem. The problem is where the loyalty lies. So we need to make sure that our loyalty now lies with the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, so what is happening in Nigeria that produces all of these problems is that Nigeria is when they try gain independence. There's a difference between independence and freedom. A country can be independent, but the people inside it are not free. It's like a company giving, having a subsidiary and giving them a board of directors and say you can run yourself now. It doesn't mean the workers are not workers anymore. So when I just gave independence in 1960, it was the British enterprise saying our Nigerian branch are entitled to run their affairs now. It, just, it didn't mean that the Nigerian people inside were free. In fact, those who were older than us would tell us that maybe they were slightly freer under the British than now. So, why, why is it persisting? Now, because the terms of relation between the ruler and the rule has not improved with independence. And what we have is the indigenization of Western rule. So, instead of having Lord Clark ruling Kano, we have uh, our own brother, Dr. Konkwaso, ruling Kano. But he's representing a Western system. So, we need now to interrogate and ask ourselves, okay, can we not change? Because independence gives you the freedom to change. But until you change, there's no freedom. So, if we refuse to change, if my aim is to replace Lugard, and we are doing it very graphically. We even remove their street and put our name to replace it. We sit on their seat, we do everything that they do. So long and short of it is that while we have a jury and all of this is that the benefit of independence have not devolved to the people. And it has all kinds of problems. But I'll, however short the time is, I will interrogate the life of the only political mentor I have, Aminu Kano. Because if we understand Aminu Kano, we solve all these problems. We do not need any theory. Amin Okano grew up in the north. He was born in 1920 and grew up in the 40s. He started noticing things around him. And noticed that what he called the family compact. It, it was not against, you know, everything we do in Nigeria today, ethnic, religious, undertone. He was a full animal, he was a Muslim, he was living in the community. But he saw that that system would fail because of what he called family compact. And that family compact was what he was talking about. And he was not talking about it just in Kano. He talked about it when he was teaching in Shokoto. He said that the first political movement was the Baoshi Improvement Union that he set up. And after that, he teamed with other people and Nepo came. And when Nepo came, the message was very clear. And what I want to say about Amino Kano that we need to understand very clearly was that you can see all the writings of Anu Kano till today. And that is true of Awolawa, Zik, and a few of them. You will never see them attack any ethnic or religious identity. They attack the problem. But today, people who talk cannot say the traffic, there's traffic jam without saying Fulani calls traffic jam and Igbo calls traffic jam. Or Yoruba calls this. So we need to go beyond that and get ideas. Second thing we need to understand was that. You can succeed in Nigeria and still fail. Yes, I always joke with Tanko because he was one of those wonderful Nigerians following President Buhari up and down. I said, you succeed in winning the election, but you still fail. Mm -hmm. So in Nigeria, you can succeed and still fail. And that is true of Sarah Minukani because the children of the Talakawas he was fighting for, in spite of the, his challenges and difficulties, the children of those Talakawas went to school and they gained power. But they are worse than the oppressors that I mean, you cannot fight. So you can say, unless we address this psychologically and get to the depth of it, because we don't have enough time today, in Nigeria, however much you solve the problem, it is structure doesn't change. So you can say, this person is marginalized today, and you give him an opportunity, next minute, he's marginalizing people even more. Yes. So if his master 
for whom he was a houseboy, was driving a Pojo 544, he wants to ride 10 Rolls Royce cars. He said, as a result, he's ready to kill anybody in the process. So to come and get this right, my conclusion in the last three minutes is that there are estates in Nigeria that have been built. We have the ethnic estates. And people are following the ethnic estates. It is the turn of Yoruba to be president. It is the turn of Igbo to be president. It is the turn of Hausa to be president. All sorts of these things are ethnic estates built by people who want to access power and control the resources. Second is the, are the religious estates. So we have these religious estates that have been built in the country and they have their structure across. Then you have the bureaucratic estates, self-perpetuating bureaucrats who corner the resources of the country and bring, the, uh, the, so they bring people to succeed them uh, and they build it up like that. These bureaucratic estates are also there. So the government goes, government comes, they, they never leave. And this, not only do they not leave, they do not allow change to percolate. And then you have the transactional estates. Those who don't care, you pay them, they give you what you want. So, and people are joining the transactional estate. So at the end of the day, what we can do, the solutions are there. Don't write one more book, because I'm not writing anything down. Go to chapter two of the Constitution. Because I have faith, people talk about the Constitution is not this, the Constitution is not that, it's not correct, it's not true federalism. All those are excuses. This Constitution, I am a lawyer in the US, where trained the Constitution, I practice constitutional law. I know the US Constitution upside down, sideways, upside down. Nigeria Constitution is far better. Nigeria Constitution is one of the best. It is not the Constitution. You can give a Mercedes Benz to a, a, a person who doesn't know how to drive, it's going to crash it. And the person knows how to travel very well, ride a bicycle, and go around the country. So it's not the Constitution. But if you have a problem with the Constitution, go to chapter 2 from section 13 to 21. Go and study. Every problem we are facing today that is worrying Tango, he cannot enjoy his 50th birthday, he's talking about, they are contained inside it. Yeah. The ethical principle that guides us, how we are going to organize our system, what our priorities should be, if we are if we implement this just for five years, you will not see, you'll be looking for Almanji, you will not see. You'll be looking for Baby Factory, you will not see. You'll be looking for Aguero, you will not see. And that is what I think we should look at. Otherwise, but how do you get it? This is this. People have to think, because the people who are poor, whether because of poverty or otherwise, or lack of reflection, are also self victimizers. So my recommendation is that you must politically identify common interests. And you don't have to be poor to be on the side of the poor. People like, um, in the younger days of PRP, people like um, Sule Lamido, they're from royal families, they're not poor. By the way, they joined the NEPU and they joined PRP. People like Wale Jenica were in PRP before. Um, Shino Achebe, who said there was a country. When he believed in the country, he was part of PRP. And this movement, and I believe that many people here are products of. If from Shehu Sani that um, uh, Shehu referred, there's no former activist. He was ambushed in the Senate. He, he, was, he was set up and sent to a lion's den. So the father is alive at all, uh, you should congratulate him. So, so long and short of this is that we must identify common interests. But the poor must not work politically against the poor. When I address the NSAS people, many of them were not happy with me, and I asked them, You said that you are being beaten up, you are being abused by police. Majority of police are youth like you. Majority of policemen are from poor family like you. So why are you you should have a discussion poor to poor, young to young. Because the police is run by the by the, by the youngest people in the country and by people from uh, not so I mean common families. Then common purpose. The purpose of politics should be the common good. I can tell you no rich man has anything to lose by the disappearance of poverty in Nigeria. The richest people all over the world in Scandinavia, all over the countries that have solved poverty problems. They are rich, they don't become poorer. Rather, they become richer. So I will appeal to those who are doing well to think that if we have an egalitarian government and a person who is working towards eradicating poverty is leading, leading the government, that they are going to be poor. It is not true. And we must form a government at the national, state, 
local and community level that wants to eliminate poverty. Thank you very much.